So, no, 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 so first and foremost, it's the other way around. I I I pressured Kanchan to put this session together, and he really obliged us and actually put this together in two flat days. So thank you, Kanchan, for doing that. Um, it wasn't the other way around, <laughs> but I must I must give him credit for pulling this together this quickly. And thank you all for coming in. I mean, that's the, we we are absolutely delighted with the volume of participants at such short notice. The way we thought of this session is, is a relatively uh, informal discussion. Uh, what we thought we'd start with uh, is broadly discuss the constituents of, of the funding ecosystem that we're looking at in the digital space. You know, there's lots of uh, confusion about what advantage is disadvantage. You know, you've got accelerators which have shown up on the scene in the last 24 months, right? With the exception of Morpheus, obviously, which has been around for a little longer. But, you know, suddenly accelerators have become active. Uh, you know, there's seed funds which are there in the market. You know, they're angels, they're angel networks. Uh, and then there are the conventional VCs. You know, so the first thought was that let's talk about what are the advantages, disadvantages, when to use any one of them, right? Uh, and I've just got some brief notes that we put together in terms of uh, how we thought we'd structure this. And if there are any additional thoughts that you guys have, we'd be more than happy to incorporate that into the conversation. I think the second thing that we wanted to link to that is the stage of the businesses and how they match to the funding ecosystem itself, right? So right from a concept to, you know, let's say a, a product in beta or alpha to a customer POC to, you know, to another extreme where you've actually got proven scalable uh, unit economics, right? And how that plays into each one of the uh, participant space, so to say. So I think those are the first two things we thought we'd cover because you know that will give you an idea of who you should speak with when you actually have a conversation <coughs> about funding uh, you know, this thing, and and you know uh, whose sweet spot it is. So uh, you know it'll, it'll give you the pros and cons of who to hit with. Uh, the second thing we wanted to definitely talk about is how to monetize your businesses, right? I mean I think uh, a couple of things around that is that we definitely have noticed we've you know met with over. 100 businesses in the last three months. Um, so, some things that we've noticed around uh, how people estimate opportunities, the monetization streams they consider, uh, what makes a business eminently fundable from a monetization perspective, uh, you know, uh, transaction versus subscription versus advertising models, you know, what works, what doesn't. Uh, I think I think that's that's something that I thought we've we've seen a lot of variation in. And if you guys think that adds value, we'd love to bring that to the conversation. Um, then the estimation of the size of the opportunity that you've got. I think that's a critical piece when you, uh, when you select a business opportunity. I think it's a critical piece uh, when you do that. Uh, because the concept of scale that we've seen people uh, come up with is entirely different from how uh, somebody on the other side might see, might see the same thing. So we'd like to spend a little bit of uh, time around the concept of what is scale, you know, because someone thinks that, you know, growing a business to 20 crores is a large scale, right? But from somebody else's perspective, that's a, you know, year one target. That's not something that is a scaled business. For a business that's IPOable, maybe you need a target of 300 crores, 400 crores turnover, right? So the question is, what is scale? How do you judge scale and opportunity when you try and look at it? and say, is this business scalable and should I be looking at VC money to scale this to some other level? That's, 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 that's an interesting way to kind of look back upon your own business plans, upon your own thoughts, about your own opportunities itself and uh, figure that out. Um, then Pearl is definitely going to talk about So Pearl, Pearl would definitely talk about uh, you know the founding team fits to the businesses that you're trying to come up with. Uh, I think that's another critical area which is often overlooked. Uh, I think that's something that you guys need to assess. Every team has some gaps. There is no team without gaps. That's that's just a simple, honest fact, right? The question is that you know uh, how do you look at those gaps and how do you plan to address them? I think that that's a very important thing because at the end of the day. Uh, anybody who's funding a business or anybody who's building a business, investing in a business, is really looking at funding an opportunity and a team, right? So 
the team is a very large constituent of, of businesses actually successfully getting funded. Right? So I think that's an important piece that you guys should, we guys would like to discuss. Um, and some, some, some little chitter chatter around uh, proof of concept. Uh, you know, people, people have different versions of proof of concepts, and you know what we think constitutes a good proof of concept. And then there's just smaller notes. So that's that's what we want to do. Is there any other suggestion? Because interactive session. So any other suggestion that you guys have that you would like covered in the conversation? Um, something around the uh, So we're going to cover a little bit about distribution and how it's become pretty much the new IP. Uh, and I think I think that's a great point. So I think we should look at that. Uh, your e-commerce play as versus uh, e-commerce play with one channel. Talk about that in you mean offline and online? Yeah. Yeah. Combination. Anything else? Sounds good. Fair enough. So, um, let me just uh, take advantage of this little thing over here. And just draw this out. So, on one side, I'm going to try and draw out the various players, right? So, I'm just going to it's going to be brief accelerators and we'll say internal networks. that a business typically goes through, right? So let's say concept. Sorry, this B A just is beta or alpha or whatever, right? I'm just limited space. Which is basically 
or till the early proof of concept stage, right? Accelerators can prove to be really helpful. Now, accelerators, the biggest benefit that they bring more often than not is the fact the connections and the mentors that they bring with them. It is not the funding. The money is incidental, right? What is really important about joining, or what really benefits a business from joining an accelerator is the fact that most accelerators have strong mentor networks attached with them. They have connections, they help you get to a lot of people which you otherwise would not be able to reach. So Pearl and I work with almost four accelerators at this point in time. Not because we see an immediate pipeline coming out of there, but because we think it's critical to improve the overall quality in the ecosystem. So accelerators really have an important role to play. They help you iterate your idea, they help you shape your idea. They get you to interact with people who are, uh, you know, been in the industry in various spaces, functions. And with all those inputs in a, you know, three to four month program, they then, after you're done with a iterated product, they put you in front of the industry again to demonstrate the progress that you've made. After that, it's up to you to use those connections and move your business even further along, right? But fundamentally, do not go to an accelerator for money. Go to an accelerator for the value addition that you'll get on the human network side that they'll bring. Right? It's extremely important that people understand that accelerators are not about the 5 lakhs that you get from them or the 10 lakhs that you might get from them. Are we, are we on board? Any questions about that? Some of the, <coughs> I don't want to take names of accelerators, but some there are now uh, some fairly good professionally run accelerators. Uh, you know, then you just have to be a little picky and choosy because they're coming up by a dozen now. Uh, so be picky and choosy. Uh, take a look at their previous companies, how they've done, how many of them have raised subsequent rounds of funding. Uh, try and take a look at the kind of uh, teams that they've taken in, right? And the ideas that they've done. If the ideas, if they've done similar businesses in their portfolio, right, that would be very helpful to you because you know that they've done uh, played around with those concepts before and have some data points to guide you more specifically. Or if their mentor network is people that you think would be extremely beneficial to your business, right? They, that would be really critical again, what you'd look for in an accelerator. So that's, that's, that's what I think of accelerators. There's some good accelerators in practically every city. And if you don't find a good accelerator in your city, come to Delhi, I'll help you. Okay? Uh, Angel Networks is the next. Uh, so, uh, Angel, let's take that we'll take a point of You know, accelerators normally take a really small stake. So, accelerators will typically take anything from a couple of percent for absolutely, you know, they invest on the low side, like a lakh of rupees, right? Even if they go up to a 10 or 12 lakh investment, they take at best 6, 7, 8 percent. Right? Most accelerators don't take more than that. So, it, they'll give you, Muta Muta, they'll give you a valuation in the range of, you know, I think between 50 and a crore, depending on how far your product. So it's it's accelerators are generally fair play, right? They're not they're not sharks. So no, I I like them for that reason. There are sharks out there. Okay, I I'll be really honest. There are, right? There are people who will give you 15 lakhs and ask for 40 percent of your company, right? And we one of the reasons we're doing this is to tell you not to do that, right? I mean this is this is uh, you know so. Sorry, it's a controversial statement, but nonetheless, but there are there are people out there uh, who do that, and accelerators are generally uh, fairly good in their ethics and what they're really playing with and the kind of equity that they take. Uh, and because of that, I strongly recommend them. That and the combination of that work, the, equity, the money is really small, so it's not it's not a game changer. But it's the network that you gain access to when you're there and the additional mentoring that you do in a brief compact period uh, and the businesses that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis because they know that there are 30 other founders sitting in that same room as you are. Right? So all of that adds to moving your business along much faster and putting it on a faster path. And that's, that's, that's the real kicker over there. Then you've got angel networks. Angel networks pretty much play from here to one level lower. Very rarely do you see angel networks participating in you know, a, a pre-seed you know, pre a or a series A kind of pre-series A or a, you know, a series A kind of thing. 
So really they play from here to here, right? Uh, the pros and cons of an angel network. Uh, they don't have structured mentoring, right? And typically you'll find that in an angel network, you'll have one or two people who will take the lead for the network in investing into that business. Everybody has a day job, right? So all of them are relatively tied up with what they're doing. Uh, but you get some degree of mentoring and because these people are successful in what they've done, to that extent, they will bring a certain level of connections uh, to the table. Um, but what I like about angel networks more than the mentoring, honestly, uh, unless you get a great guy like a Ranajan Anandan sitting on your board, uh, which is uh, rare enough, but unless you get something like that, I honestly believe that the value of angel networks comes together in the size of the check that they can cut. Right? Uh, the mentoring on an equivalent basis, you can find other opportunities. Like I said, even an accelerator will give you that much mentoring for a smaller stake and a lower this thing in a more intense full-time format. So it's not to me, it's not the it's not the mentoring that comes from there necessarily. Uh, that's that's the big kicker on the on the uh, let's say uh, angel network side. For me, the big kicker over there as an, as an ex-entrepreneur is the fact that you can raise a decent amount of money, right? And get some element of mentoring. Right? The mentoring is the second kicker, not the first kicker over here. Whereas in an angel network, the first thing that you'd really look at is the mentoring, right? So again, that's that's my thought on angel networks. Uh, the, you guys know angel networks and there's Mumbai angel network here, there's Indian angel network, with Delhi and now I think they go to Bangalore. There's a Bangalore Angel Network that's being set up, I think, by the extension of the Mumbai uh, team there. Uh, there's Hyderabad, there's Chennai also that started. Uh, in addition to that, there's GSF. Uh, there's a couple of others, right? So there are a bunch of them. Um, if you're looking at raising money from an Angel Network, see who's coming on your board. Uh, see who's leading the deal uh, from their side. Uh, because to me, that's an important part of what you're doing. At any point in time, oh, wow. you see, beyond, beyond, let's say, an accelerator who never really sit on your board, beyond that, everybody else will take the seats on your board more often than not. Right? Whether actively, whether passively, but they will have some level of board management. So beyond that accelerator stage, start being very careful about who you're picking to sit on your board. Because if he doesn't get your business or business model, Right? Uh, or he thinks it's just, a, you know, it, it's not smart money, right? There's money, there's always money, you know, if they're investing, it's money. But the question if it's not smart money, it may be more, uh, it may be a drag on the business's speed than an advantage to it because for everything you want to do, you need to explain, right? So be wary about that as you move forward, but always see that who's leading the deal, right, from the angel network side, because there will be some guys who are brilliant, right? But there will be some guys who may not make the same cut, right? So always look at what you're getting specifically as part and parcel of that deal in terms of the constituents uh, or the lead from the angel network side who's going to work with you on an aggressive basis. Because angel network, you know, 20 guys will get together to make a 25 lakh investment or a 50 lakh investment, right? So it's not that all 20 will spend time with you. Right? There's, there'll be one or two guys managing that deal. Right? And those two guys are going to determine the quality of support that you're going to get largely. Right? So focus on those two people and generally the uh, reputation of the network. Uh, you know, honestly, uh, accelerators take stake as, uh, okay, it happens completely differently for all sorts of these things. So it depends on what legal structures they set up here. Uh, you can have a syndicated structure, you can have an individual structure. However, what will happen for sure is that if they come in as a group, they will all take the same rights in a similar document, right? But how they enter into the asset itself may be dictated by 20 other things. Do you get what I'm saying? So the terms that they'll take will all be the same, right? So whether they come as a, yeah. Right. it's all about the, more about the money, less about the mentoring. Is it better that you take money from a, from, from a serious angel who's actually ready to bet his shirt on it. Like if he's ready to give you a couple of crores, go and ask crores, instead of 10, 20 guys actually coming together and doing that. So again, I, I'm not, I'm not um, 
So don't don't take away from the fact that the 20 guys who are actually invested also have a vested interest in your business, right? Uh, I'm just saying that when you look at the mentoring aspect of that of the angel network, remember it's the two guys or one guy who will be leading that transaction who will be driving 80% of the mentoring, right? There is no formal network beyond that, and the fact that those guys have day jobs, right? Even the serious angel you're talking about will have a day job, will have a business. That's how he's able to do this, right? So it's not that he's a serious angel and he's putting two crores. He's going to come sit in your office and say, "Pata beta kya madad chahiye," right? It's not that. You keep that in mind. I think fundamentally, what I'm trying to say is, understand the pros and cons, and then the individual circumstances are completely different, right? So if you get a Rajan Anandan as an individual investor in your business, right? Forget any angel network. That his name carries more credibility than uh, all the angel networks put together, right? On the flip side, uh, if you if you get an angel network where you know uh, let's say uh, let's say Indian angel networks and Alok Mittal is leading the deal for you, and you know he's the guy who's going to be sitting on your board, that's great value addition, right? But if there is somebody else, right? And I don't want to take names. Right in that same angel network who have led deals for that network before, and they're going to be sitting on your board. I wouldn't recommend that money. Right? Remember this: that the angel network itself comprises of a very diverse set of individuals with disposable income. You get what I'm saying? It's a very set of it's a set of very diverse individuals. Some of them may have nothing to do with digital businesses. Right? A lot of them have nothing to do with digital. Business. A lot of them is just their passion and interest, right? And they want to put some money somewhere. Some people just they may have some digital expertise, but they're so tied down in their day-to-day -day jobs, right? Like a very close friend and neighbor of mine, he's so tied up in his regular life that he's unable to mentor the companies he invests in, and he invests as an individual, my people, as an individual angel, right? And consequently, he's lost some 70 lakhs already doing angel investing. He's never made money on angel deal. and i think it's also important uh, that we are able to as startup founders go and extract value from those angel investors if you think they will come back to you they possibly won't but how much you are on their back to get value i think is also important i'd like to add one thing uh, i thought your question was also directed at that if you getting clean money um, do you really need mentoring right Probably, uh, yeah, yeah? So the only thing I'd like to say is that I don't think uh, mentoring can make entrepreneurs very clearly. Uh, but um, there are a few things that anybody needs to make a business successful. If you have a large professional experience behind you, which is directly applicable to the business you are now building, right? And your connections of your own address book and your past experiences are going to help you in that business, you probably don't need mentoring. If you are going to go into a field where you are going to be the only thing is you're very passionate about something, you know, like something you've done, you're passionate about it, but you probably have nothing in your past experience which translates into direct applicable uh, knowledge. Or it's right. Uh, it is important to realize that there are for every business idea, there are at least in any local market, like let's say in India. For any business idea, and now now we can say that with 200 plus companies that we've seen, which is just starting of what we're going to do for the next few years, um, for every business idea we've seen already 10, 15 startups approaching it for from different angles. Now, money, some of them will have and some of them won't. The ones that don't get money will not make it, maybe, but the ones that get money, still there's only going to be one or two winners. And more often than not, we've seen where business connections. um the right um experience wherever those that network was there those businesses could get faster traction and could scale faster and could avoid making some of the mistakes some of the mistakes i mean you can never erase all mistakes but some mistakes which really cost dearly in terms of time and money can be avoided and that is really what changes the probability of success so to kanchan's point one It is the entrepreneur's initiative to extract value, but at the same time, it is also the entrepreneur's responsibility to realize that at that stage of the business, are you just going for the money, or are you going for a money plus? Okay, I, I have a supplementary question. Yeah. The point is that look, what approach I have taken, I don't know whether that's right or wrong. If you can validate that, I have actually looked at everything in a modular fashion. 
like if I want some technology expertise and find a good guy, maybe give him a percentage or two, get him on board for that. I have got two very, very bulge bracket mentors on my board. I have got a clean angel who's put, I mean, who doesn't know anything about the business, he's got passion about the opportunity, somewhat uh, trust on us. So there is a modular approach for mentoring, technology, access, and so let, me just give you, ideas let me just give you a quick 10 second thing on that. The amount of time and effort it takes to build it out in that way, because you may or may not get the quality of mentor that you require. Right now, let's just take, let me just flip this around because we keep saying quality, 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 and you know, mentor network, and I'm not giving you substance around it. Okay, so let me give you substance around it so that it creates a reference point of what I consider a decent quality network. Right? So I'll talk about the five ideas mentor network. We've divided it into three basic spaces, right? We've said functional experts, right, which are primarily ex-entrepreneurs or experts in particular spaces. So there you've got people like, uh, let's start with uh, uh, the media space. You've got uh, the CEO of Comly. You've got the CEO of uh, Interactive Avenues. You've got, uh, so we've got Shantanu, we've got this one. We've got Gulshan, who runs the India business for them. Uh, we've got on the mobile side, we've got InMobi, we've got 197, so we've got Vijay, we've got, uh, you know, so some, some people like that on the media side. I'm giving you examples and just some shape types examples, right? On the flip side, let's say as ex-entrepreneurs on the e-commerce side, there's the two of us, there's Alok Mitpal, there's Pani, uh, Pani from Red Pass. Uh, there'll be more examples like that and I can keep going on and on. Uh, on, let's say, the mobile side, you've got uh, the head of Google Mobile, you've got Nokia, the head of uh, the Nokia Mobile Initiatives, you've got, uh, you know, a ton of other very, very, in addition to, let's say, uh, going back to Vijay or, you know, uh, in Mobi, where you've got uh, someone else signed up there, right? So, which makes your mobile mentor network, right? Then on the investor side, you've got investors like, you know, Alok, you've got Rahul, you've got, uh, you know, uh, the two of us, you've got you know, Mahindra Swarup, you've got, you know, a bunch of other people like that who are all uh, this thing like that. On the platform company side, you've got Kritika from Facebook, you've got Arun from Yahoo, you've got, you know, Neville from Microsoft, you've got... Now, to me, this is a mentor network which says whatever you require, right, you're going to approach it from the top. You're getting the best from day zero. Right? So, when I say that a uh, Let's say, when I say that we have a strong mentor network, right, I am talking of a quality, this is my definition of a quality network, to put it in perspective, right? So, if I say that uh, angel network doesn't necessarily give you the same quality of mentorship, it is with this reference point in mind, right? But I am saying this is the kind of network that is available to you from day zero by picking money from the smart, from, from picking smart money from day zero rather than going out and saying, how do I connect with this guy? How do I connect with that guy? I want to use Facebook for distribution. I want to see how I can use Google as a platform. Rather than try and do that on an individual basis, you focus on your business. We'll get you those connections instantly. That's the difference. Right? Just to put it in perspective, and the reason I'm giving a reference point is so that you guys understand. Otherwise, everyone's you know not talking hawa mein, wo mentoring kar raha hai, ye mentoring kar raha hai. When I talk of a mentor network, this is the quality of network that's the benchmark for me. Okay? Does that now give you perspective to my answer? Let's just uh, jump to seed funds. So seed funds, you've got you've got some really good seed funds now starting up. Uh, uh, so you've had Bloom, which has now raised another round and is doing, I think, I think they're doing some good work. You've got K, which has been a, you know, an old player in the space. Uh, there's us who come in with a relatively differentiated offering. Um, there are some players who've been in the space earlier who are still doing some deals in the space, whether it's a seed fund itself, though they're moving up the value chain. So there are some, there is some money that is coming in from the space. Each one of them has their own value props. Uh, K, for example, can write bigger checks than we can. A Bloom has a bigger portfolio than we'll ever aspire to have. Right? We bring a blend of the money, the smart mentoring, and our abilities and experience as a combination, what we call a combination of human capital, social capital, and financial capital. Right? So that is our USP in that space. Right? So everybody has their own this thing. The ticket sizes obviously are larger. 
what we've tried to do is blend some of the benefits that uh, come with the check size of seed funds, right, with the benefits of what we thought was a best-in-class practice, which is what we saw at accelerators, the major networks. So we've tried to blend those two at this level and create a completely different offering. Because frankly, uh, you know, like Pearl has said many times, at this stage of a business, the venture is more important than the capital itself. Right. So, you know, uh, how do I explain that? I mean, at the end of the day, if the venture doesn't succeed, it doesn't make a difference to your investor. Are. Right? The most important thing is making sure the venture moves to the next level. And to move it to the next level, very often, you need to make sure you don't make the mistakes that, you, that other people did, and you do things, more things right or better or differentiated than other people would be doing in the market. Like Paul said, it's an intensely competitive market. Right? For every idea, there are 15 different businesses stacking it from different perspectives. How do you get the advantage of assimilated knowledge that lies in that space, right? So you can make sharper and more intelligent decisions vis-a-vis -vis your competition, right? So fundamentally, that's the premise that we play with, right? Uh, and then you have VCs. VCs typically come in once you have uh, proof of scalable unit economics. Uh, everybody over here knows what unit economics is, right? Unit economics basically means that you kind of break down the business to a single transaction level or the lowest level in lowest uh, complete level of transaction that you can build the business down to break it down to, right? And you see that how that business would work on an incremental transaction basis. Because if there is a positive GM on an incremental basis, then the business is contributing to its base costs and therefore is a business that when you scale it, will start making money. I won't go into the details of that, but fundamentally it's looking at a business at the smallest individual unit. Right? Do you make money at the individual transaction level or not? No, that's how you analyze the business. Right? So once you see a set of scalable unit economic metrics, then you just pump cash into the business because you know it's scalable and it will give you the money you require. It will give you the returns that you require. Till then you keep iterating to find what is the right mix and you don't throw a ton of money into the business. So VCs come in when they know that okay the unit economics look scalable and the volume of money that we are pumping in will push the business into an accelerated vertical uh, path, growth path. Right? So let's say a series A is the uh, very early growth cap. Right? So it's, it's, it's directed at taking businesses which have got proven unit economics or identified unit economics which look scalable and pumping cash to take them to the next level. Right? So that's, that's, that's that particular concept. So any questions around this before I move to the next subject? Just on the percentage, like you said accelerator would probably take anywhere between 2 to 6%. So, so good question. So okay. So. Uh, you know, individual angels and accelerator networks, I won't comment on the percentages they take uh, because sometimes they take more than what I think you should. Uh, my simple advice to you as entrepreneurs, in any round that you raise, please make sure you don't dilute more than 30%, preferably 25%. Any single round. Any single round. All together, from the beginning. So, so if you raise money at let's say uh, seed stage, right, and let's say a seed fund comes in to put in 50 lakhs into your business, please make sure that 50 lakhs doesn't represent more than 25% of your capital. If tomorrow after that Sequoia comes in at series A and says I'll put in 2 million, even then it shouldn't represent more than 25% of your capital. Right? If someone, angel wants to put in 5 lakhs on an idea stage, right, or 15 lakhs on an idea stage, please make sure it doesn't represent more than 25% of your capital. In any round of financing that you're raising, and it, the risk matrix is up there, please make sure that whatever you do, you don't dilute that for the simple reason that as your business grows, and most businesses will need cash up to a certain point in time. If the entrepreneur himself doesn't have a large enough chunk of equity, right, 
even downstream investors will say that no, it's too risky because the entrepreneur can walk away. Right? So if let's say investors own 80% of a business, you know the entrepreneur is less incentivized to critical sacrifice eight years of his life than the investors are. Because they own 80%, he owns 20%. Why? What is his motivation? He says, boss, they own 80, they'll make it work, they'll find some other chapu who'll do this. Right? That's reality, it's happened. Not once, it's happened hundreds of times. So, you need to make sure. So, investors will also walk away from a transaction where they see that the entrepreneurs are too inadequately, let's say, tied in. Right? So, to make sure you don't reach that situation, right? Please don't ever dilute more than 25%. If you're really desperate, right? But don't stretch it beyond that. That is not advisable. So the second round, you say again, not to exceed more than twenty-five percent. That would be really that we, as a promoter, would hold, or is that combined with the investor? Uh, okay, cap table, yeah, cap table. But it's not that if you raise money in the cap table, right? You and the investor will get diluted proportionately, no? Right. So it would be a combined. Yeah, always cap table. Uh, what about the fact that somebody says that okay, from the Companies Act point of view, I need 26% to block resolutions which are not uh, And what about the second aspect that clawbacks is a possibility? Like we have done, 30, we are actually in the process of doing a 35% kind of uh, state deals right now. It's almost true. But so, if, uh, uh, I mean, what if there is a clawback provision in that? Is that any sense? So, um, can we, I think, move to the next section and, you know, because I think this clawback and all that will make it very funding related and there are lots of other things to talk about yeah, as well. But so, I think we can take that off. Fundamentally, keep in mind, so keep in mind that, uh, keep it simple. Don't, don't, don't do all of that. Keep it really simple. It's always better to have simple transactions. Okay, so let me, let me talk a little bit about estimating opportunities and, uh, you know, the monetization model. Uh, I think I think the first thing that we always say to you guys is keep your monetization model simple. Uh, keep it transaction first businesses uh, or subscription businesses. You know businesses which uh, drive transactions. Focus on your core products. And when you come for when you when you plan a business, please don't say I'll have 25 revenue streams, right? Because at the end of the day, every business has one or two core offerings. Right? You can't have 25 core offerings. Then it's not core. So please focus on one or two basic offerings and for any digital business, let's okay, for most digital businesses that are relatively easier to fund, it needs to be a transaction-led model, right? Uh, Advertising-led models in India will struggle because of the depth of the market for the next two, three years, right? Even at a, let's take a web-based business, even at 25 million page views, your net monetization at a 75 rupees CPM will give you 18 lakhs of rupees a month. Right? In 18 lakhs of rupees a month, you'll barely be able to cover the basic cost, let alone the you know the, the kharcha to drive traffic to create 25 million page views. Right? So please be very realistic and don't build businesses that are entirely dependent upon advertising. Don't even look at it as a key revenue stream if I may suggest so. Right? Build simple transaction oriented businesses, whether it's a subscription model, whether it's a premium model, whether it's something else, whether it's a pure travel, pure e-commerce type model, whether it's simple services transaction on a time by time basis, keep it simple. No complexity around that. That's extremely important. It makes it easy to test, easy for the consumer to understand, easy to scale. Right? All those good things come together. Right? However, Advertising-led models will struggle in the country for the next couple of years. So if you're thinking that you know you're going to have an ad-led model for your business, it's going to be challenging. Right? It's going to be challenging. Uh, also, please don't think of 25 services and say I will do all of the above. Right? There are one or two core services that you can do for your monetization. It can't be everything. Right? You know, what do you uh, suggest for content? You know, great question. Uh, well, would you like to take that? Because content is... Because uh, subscription doesn't really work in your content, right? Yes, sir. So, uh, content is... Um, by default, content is going to follow an advertising monetization. And I think Gaurav answered that in the beginning. 
So I've been involved in uh, the advertising led monetization models for 10, over 10, close to 10 years. And um, I haven't, uh, as an entrepreneur, I will not ever build an advertising led model. And the reason is that um, very few consumer content plays in today's world, even more than it was when I was in that space, uh, um, the destination sites are very difficult to build. The way consumers are um, consuming content is in a very distributed and a fragmented fashion today. So just having a, a very powerful URL today where customers continue to come on their own, right, and that continues to scale, right, it's very difficult to build businesses beyond 5-10 million pages in a country like India. And I'm, I, it's difficult overseas as well, but there is more funding available. And again, you know, uh, an entrepreneur, sometimes I've, I've, I've reflected upon it, that should an entrepreneur build a business thinking funding? Well, at the end of the day, it's a business, right? I, either you have the capital to keep funding it, which is fine, but if you're going to look for external cap capital, then if you have a business which is going to be page view, first consumers will come, then they will consume a lot of page views or spend a lot of minutes on your site and then you will go and sell that proposition to advertisers, right? You or agencies will do that. It is difficult for money to happen that way. And the kind of cost it takes to build content, at a very small scale, content looks very easy to build. But at a scale where the network effect has to take place, and consumers have to bring in more consumers kind of a play, that scale is, is fairly capital intensive. Companies like Yahoo, like the reality is that they were content plays and I'm not talk only talking about companies like Yahoo. If you have 10, 20 million page views, more often than not you'll get monetized through an ad network. You'll get as low CPMs as 15 and 20 rupees for every thousand page views you build. You'll put Google Ads in it, then you'll have some premium inventory. I mean, you know, in, in the last 8-10 years, this hasn't changed and it's not likely to change because think about how you consume media. How many, uh, how many of us go to specific URLs on the web and consume content? Um, it's, it's all coming through apps, through social. I mean, our content consumption has moved to a completely different paradigm. And ultimately, you become content producers, not distributors. And given the distribution game is in the hands of the Googles and the Facebook, large scale distribution game, you're basically saying I'm going to produce content and somehow hope that money is going to come in by advertising. So net net, I know that doesn't answer a question, answer the question for someone building a content business uh, from a perspective of I would, uh, but a net net, like we, when we debated whether we would fund advertising led models, we said we wouldn't. Would we fund ad tech models? Yes, we would, because that is really the technology that is powering more and more efficient advertising for advertisers making more money for publishers. But would we uh, fund publishing-led business? We wouldn't. So, you know, it's a, I would say that you should brace yourself for being very cost-light, figuring out how you can create network effect of content production, crowdsourcing and really build your business if you're really hell-bent upon making a... Fundamentally what you're saying is exceptionally challenging and that's very why we're suggesting that don't head down that path, right? Uh, however, in niches like for example, we see Circle as a premium subscription, I don't know if it covers their costs, right? But nonetheless, they're between their subscriptions and events, they're doing something. It's survival, right? But my, if you have to head that way. But that's not a scalable or uh, easy path to choose. And that's why we're giving you these insights. I Pearl gave you, uh, you know, 25 million, you'll end up in a network anyway. I'm telling you, even if all 25 million was premium inventory that was sold at 75 million, that will give you just 15, 18 lakhs a month. Right? If you have to fund a national network to generate those many page views, right, which means that you must have enough pages and enough content that is continuously refreshed, that will cost you more than that. Tons more than that, I promise you. Even if you're building a lead. It's a refreshing, it's a, I'm just, when I think of your story, now that's a niche which Shraddha built out as an example. Um, I think it's a very sticky property because it served a niche which did not exist, right, uh, which was not tapped. At the same time, if you would think through how 
they would make money it would be through you know uh, events and little bit through advertising and uh, there's a space which they are very clearly indispensable today so they they're going to be able to make their pnl work is this a business which will get external funding easily no right so think through the metrics when you build a content business it should be something which is more a boutique business which you are building serving a specific niche don't go for large generic plays that never works that's in the hands of the biggies so i let's just go back does that answer your question let's just go back quickly and you know there's just one piece we'd like to cover before we jump into uh, founding team market fit which bird will talk about uh, <coughs> that's estimating uh, that estimating your market size uh, market opportunity and the concept of scale uh, first and foremost please please understand this that there is no there is no however differentiated your services there is always a substitute that man is consuming today right if you're designing new clothes the guy is buying clothes if you're designing new shoes the guy is buying shoes if you're selling tickets he was buying tickets offline if you're selling if you're if you're giving them restaurant deals the guy was buying food before this there is always an offline market which you can look at which is either serving that need directly or indirectly there is never a scenario where there is no data available because what i'm doing is absolutely new we come across a lot of people who actually make statements like that um uh, we come across a lot of people who haven't done enough homework on what it would take to build uh, the, the specific place place that you're looking at and the adjacencies and you know pieces around your own market which you need to be sure of now when an investor comes and sits with you about your business he expects you to be the expert in that space right so one thing you guys must make sure that you get in place when you go and talk to an investor is know the market and its adjacencies like the back of your hand extremely strong advice please do as much research as you can be smart about it because the guy is not looking to someone like me if i come and look at investing in xyz business i'm not i'm not an expert in that space i'm looking for you to be the expert i'm betting behind and if you don't know the market yourself and say boss there's no direct data available boss what i'm doing is absolutely new it's never happened before in this country right uh, uh, sorry you know uh, many times indirectly being served with someone all you're doing is bringing it online or giving it to them in a different form you have to look carefully and understand right that who is serving that need today what is the scale there so let's take the example of make my trip right if make my trip was let's say before make my trip started there was nobody else doing online ticket right or maybe there was one portal that had started in india before they could go up and say the market is exactly 50000 rupees a month because that one guy in the market is doing 50000 rupees a month right or they could go out and say no there's a billion dollars of travel ticketing happening that's the opportunity i plan to bring 10% of this online right none of that was happening in the offline in the online space right so the online market for ticketing was zilch or 50000 rupees right but he looked at a billion dollar opportunity and converted that similarly if you look at vertical let's say online retail it isn't that people aren't buying clothes or you know books xyz the gazillion things you get online they're buying it at their local stores look at a grocery mall they're buying it at their kirana stores look at vertical big shoe bazaar right or jv as it's called today they were buying shoes elsewhere look at whatever you bringing online per se people are always consuming it to get content businesses right if you're building a let's say a, a you know a vc circle or something like that people were consuming that content in offline reports or magazines right yeah, uh, but then there is let's say for my case there is a 
online flower shop already existing and if I come with a me too flower shop, online flower shop, what is the differentiation? I am not talking of differentiation, I am talking of market estimation. First, okay. I am saying that as an entrepreneur, if you don't know your market, and you don't know the adjacencies in your market because that's where people creep into your space from, right? Or that those are spaces where you can grow into, right? That's a big failure. So I'm talking about that, right? We're not talking about differentiation right now. We're saying a lot of people say, because my product is differentiated, there is no market estimate I can give you. I'm saying that's a walking, talking disaster, right? There is always a market estimate. You need to know the market like the back of your hand you are the expert people are betting behind. So if you don't know the market, why will he bet behind you? Very important point. And I think that's something that we definitely wanted to get across to most people. I'd just like to add one little thing here that this is coming out of the experience of these 200 plus startups that we've met. Um, probably we stepped into entrepreneurship after a long grueling in the professional world where we couldn't walk into our managers or our team members at some stage couldn't walk into our room with half-baked thinking on the market sizing of even the smallest project that we would launch, uh, we find it baffling that um, entrepreneurs are willing to bet their next several years behind an idea without having done that due diligence for themselves. You know, Gaurav's point was also saying this is a must-must as you go to an investor because for me that becomes literally a five-minute conversation and I'm like if this individual hasn't spent time thinking through the market, we're definitely not going in. But for you guys as entrepreneurs, that's an extremely critical first step to be able to figure out what kind of a business you want to build. So, well, there's one uh, associated point that I'd like to make, which is the concept of scale. Right? Uh, I touched upon this earlier. It's extremely important that you understand this. Right? That when you present the market size, that's 100 crores. Right? And think that's a great market opportunity. Realistically, any player is going to dominate, let's say, again, there's going to be a part of that market that's really addressable, right? And out of that, you're going to have a share, right? So if you're presenting a market size that is 100 crores, effectively, you're saying you can build a business in it viably, which is maybe 20 crores maximum, right? So when you think of the opportunity, right, please think of an opportunity matrix, right, which is genuinely scalable. So if I'm looking at a 4,000 crore opportunity in five years from now, right, then I'm saying that yes, I can build a 400 to 500 crore business in that space. But if I'm showcasing a 40 crore opportunity or a 100 crore opportunity or a 500 crore opportunity, the, take a broad thumb rule that your business is not going to be more than 10% of the market opportunity. Just take that as a rule and uh, uh, swallow it as a bitter pill. How much ever you'd like it to be bigger than that, just take a bitter pill and swallow it. Okay? 10% is widely optimistic, just take that. Okay? Now, if the market opportunity is not big enough for a few hundred crores, you, your business to be a few hundred crores, right, means it can't really be a business where an IPO or something like that is a viable exit. Right? Not that we're saying that's the only exit possible, right? But when you're thinking of scale and picking and choosing ideas, right, you must look at opportunities that are in that if you want to go for venture capital funding, right? Because there are lifestyle businesses and then there are businesses that will scale. Lifestyle businesses, please don't go for venture capital because they will just kill you. They will kill the business, right? Lifestyle businesses are businesses where Grow it to a certain scale, you're happy with the dividends that are coming through and the profit that you're making, it generates cash for you. Everything is nice and fine. You take three holidays a year, right? And the world is good, right? The venture capital business, like Deep Kalra has grown gray, <laughs> IPOing his company, right? We're hoping some of the other people don't get gray IPOing their companies. But the truth is, it's a long, rolling walk. And by the time you're done building an organization, right, it's a big professional entity. So at that scale, it becomes a completely different set of challenges. And I'm just saying that that's a long walk. It's a tough job. But then there is greater value creation from a financial perspective for all the participants in that. So when you want to go for these kind of plays, make sure that the opportunity that you're addressing is not a lifestyle business, right? Because otherwise, you will just get knocked out the door, right? Uh, 
What's so lifestyle business? Lifestyle business, what do you mean by lifestyle business? That's what I explained earlier that you know it's a business which, uh, for example, uh, you will grow it to a certain scale, right? The scale itself is not something that is, let's say, an IPOable or an internationally IPOable scale, right? But it's typically a business that will give you positive cash, a uh, positive cash flow, reasonable dividends, balance of because the business won't scale beyond a certain point. Balance of let's say uh, work and life. Yeah, I mean, my friend runs a uh, public relations company, right, called Actimedia, right. It's it's one of the top public relations companies in the vertical um, uh, lifestyle and luxury uh, genre, right. It will only grow at a certain pace. It won't become a thousand crore business. Right? It's never going to be independently IPO. He's very comfortable with that. He's happy with a 25 crore turnover. He's bought his investors out two years back. That's it. He has a great life. He vacations three months a year, four months a year. It's a rich cash business, right? Because it's it's investment life. But that that's a lifestyle business for me. That's a lifestyle entrepreneur, right? That's not an entrepreneur. Whereas Deep Kalra has gone and IPO'd a business which is today valued at 600, 700 million dollars, right? Owns a certain percentage of it. Right? And is still running an operation which is thousands of people spanning multiple countries. Right? And he's still sitting at the helm of it despite IPOing it already. And he can't take three vacations a year. And he can't take three <laughs> vacations a year. <laughs> right? so, uh, I just want to make sure because sometimes when we talk about this, the message goes out that there is only one kind of entrepreneurship. And Gaurav sort of doesn't mean that, that there is only one kind of entrepreneurship which is scalable, scalable, and big market changing and big business building. I think there are three ways we can make money, right? We go work for a company, we substitute that into entrepreneurship and create a business which can fund our life, right? And gives us the autonomy to run it the way we want to and to create a work-life balance the way we want to. I mean, somebody's work-life balance may be working all the time, right? So it's a, it's a matter of personal choice. And then there's a third kind of entrepreneurship, which is what we typically focus on because that is what we have done before and that is what we would invest behind and that is what typically these sessions are aimed to fuel, right? Uh, which is large scale digital businesses, right? How do they come about? What does it take to build it from the entrepreneur side and from the investor side because they do need several rounds of capital usually. There is that kind of business which needs to be making sure it is targeting a fairly large market does not estimate more than capturing 10% market at maturity, right? And is thinking through multiple rounds of dilution, not once, twice, but maybe three to five times, is thinking through a really crappy work-life balance, right? And, and that's why it's important to take all of that into mind and keep in mind that when we talk about that uh, size your market and if it's a 100 crore total market and you're going to take 20 crores to you know, we see business plans which say five years I'll be a 40 crore business and we say great for you, hope you can make profits out of it and you can, you know, this is very, um, it is something that is very uh, fulfilling for you as an experience. But it is not something that external capital, external capital needs at the minimum five to seven x return. That industry is built on that model in five to seven years, venture capitalists look to get five to seven x return and correct me where I'm wrong, this is something I've learned from him. I've never really bothered about how the financing comes about, <laughs> but uh, so um, yeah. So that's that's really uh, you know the message is not. I'm so sure some of you here might be thinking of smaller scale entrepreneurial opportunities, and some may be thinking of the kind of opportunities we are talking about. Both are totally acceptable because the other alternative is working in a job, right? And that's not such a glamorous life either. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we've got uh, these. Three points, which is the team is one, and then the customer POC and distribution being the new IP. I'll just take the team first because the other two are linked. Um, and feel free to ask questions because there's some questions about how to build a business or uh, the digital uh, customer acquisition and all. Uh, on the team side, um, very um, clearly, we uh, what we've seen is and what we believe is that there has to be a sound balance in the founding team. Um, no team is perfect, like Gaurav said, but there has to be a sound balance of domain and tech if you're building a digital business. Um, uh, if I 
I we were talking to someone the other day and we said that we meet startups in Bangalore and the reason I'm not taking Mumbai is because um, we haven't done seen many startups in Mumbai. This is the first visit we made and we're meeting about 15 of them out of the uh, 50 plus that applied to us in the last couple of months. But um, when we go to Bangalore, there are very smart tech people building businesses and they think they'll outsource sales and marketing completely. When they can start get their, their product starts getting some traction, they'll hire a kick ass sales guy. And Delhi entrepreneurs are thinking they totally get the business and they'll just outsource the tech. No digital business. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's actually true. It's actually true. <laughs> and uh, heart of heart, one of our five ideas is about creating a fusion between Delhi and Bangalore. <laughs> to, and Mumbai. So I don't know what, like you'll have to help me understand that what kind of entrepreneurs are Mumbai entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite, uh, you know, if a fusion could happen between the tech talent in Bangalore and the commercial talent in Mumbai and Delhi, for example, I think some really great scalable startups can get created out of India which can go global, right? But right now the bigger challenge is that these two cities don't like each other. <laughs> like no cities in India like the other cities. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Um, uh, Domain and tech, so I'll take a couple of examples if let's say this is a, a ad advertising technology business or a business that is, yeah, ad tech business, you know, it could be powering a more efficient ad network or it could be bringing a smarter way to monetize, publisher, inventory, whichever. Then uh, we would look for media, there has to be media space experience and then who's going to build the technology behind that platform and can they create scale. If it's an e-commerce business, and e-commerce business is a fair mix of multiple domains coming, but, but there, there the domain experience is retail and supply chain, and then techno, the tech domain brings the product and uh, marketing experience, digital marketing experience to build an e-commerce business. So we see that balance. The reason we, we emphasize on that is because uh, without going into specific, specifics, we have built businesses where not necessarily the founding team had all the this these two critical pillars domain and tech together right so we had the fortune of raising money fairly fast and building that gap with, with the core team that came about very early in the business but the reason we ask for founders to think through that is because you know the business is going to go through ups and downs and the business will face stiff competition typically the winning businesses in their founding team only, they are complete on those aspects. The hiring is happening in finance and the hiring is happening in customer experience person. But if you start thinking that you're going to hire uh, an employee who's going to have the same vision because he's really good at tech and he comes from Google, and you'll just hire him because you raised some money from some VC, right? that's more often than not going to fail. So domain and tech experience is critical. Uh, and in domain, I would also say that keep in mind that even digital distribution is a domain. It's it's just not buying AdWords on Google and opening up a Facebook page. Uh, there is a whole profession in science which got built over the last 13, 14 years in that space across the globe. <coughs> and um, there are masters of that in every ecosystem. Um, and um, make sure that you, you, you give enough importance to digital distribution uh, because that's what's really going to create the traction in your business day all other hygienes fall in place. Um, the other thing is on the team besides this whole domain and tech fusion um, there is a certain DNA which entrepreneurs must have. Uh, I wouldn't say we uh, some of our, some of it was ingrained in us and we stepped into entrepreneurship some of them we learned fairly quickly but uh, the DNA that we advise entrepreneurs not you can't advise a DNA but DNA that we tell entrepreneurs you know you don't have it uh, and honestly that's the most important Back if, if an angel friend or anybody in the ecosystem can tell you whether you are built out for entrepreneurship or not. The DNA is um, speed, very fast, right? very proactive, initiative taking and um, has the passion, the founder has, should have founding team or the one founder who is the founder amongst the founder because typically every team has a founder amongst the founders. right? And that one should be able to have the passion to build the brand out of your own singular passion. You're the ambassador. I think the biggest disservice entrepreneurs do to their companies is that their own, they're so 
uh, much involved in the execution, they forget that the only individual who cares about whether this brand makes it or not is you, right? And you've got to go out and make sure that you are making uh, you're making sure that your business and brand is felt in the market from your own passion. Um, more often than not, you will see that if five startups are attacking a space, right? It's that one founder which was getting the tech crunch coverage, and it was that one founder who other entrepreneurs loved and wanted him or her to succeed, who actually got that buzz and brand build around his early stage or her early stage startup. And that's very important. So we like we like to see the DNA of people who say that they can make it out on their own, they, they have the passion, they will do things in half the time and with one fourth the money. And these are things that we've seen in day-to-day -day practice. Um, it's a very fast world out there, so these DNAs, if the founding team doesn't have, the next 10 hires will never have, and the next, every 10 hires that you make, it gets diluted. The founder's vision starts getting diluted, right? So the you've got to be the Hitler, and you've got to be also the person who, even when you don't are not in the corridors, people can sense you in that office, right? I mean, I don't know how else to explain it, but it is, it is actually that level of founder DNA, which is so important. Um, so, while he looks at the financials, when we look at, I keep thinking about the founder DNA at that time, and I keep, you know, when we come back and we uh, cross notes, we're thinking about all the aspects of the financials as well as the strategy, how is this person thinking about the market side, and he and I both give a lot of importance, and he talks about that, you know, sometimes everything is looking right, it's going to be a 500 crore business maybe, uh, the founders totally get the space. But we just don't find the DNA right. And more often than not, we end up just saying that to the founder that, you know, how would you approach this problem? And the thing is that the way the founder is approaching that problem and thinking about the 10 days they would think about finding a vendor and then doing X, Y, Z, we kind of say the DNA is not there. Skip this space, do something else. Uh, it's always hard for an entrepreneur to listen to that. But um, we, we don't think that that is, we think that is irreplaceable can't be hired and no money can bring that DNA in. Um, <coughs> yeah, um, yeah, on um, customer POC, um, I think it's very simple, like unit economics is extremely simple if you really get down to the basics. Uh, what what we consider as customer POC is, sorry. Uh, I just have a question on one of the things that you just uh, mentioned. You mentioned that it's very crucial for the founder to build a brand uh, of his own as well as the, the whole initiative that he's working on. Uh, just generally taking a perspective from you, how much do you believe that today the entrepreneurs who get into uh, a startup mode or probably the next level, okay, really believe in investing on themselves as a brand or their their company or their products or service offering as a brand? So, uh, I don't think the two are separate. Uh, I think the, it's, so the success is where the fusion happens. Right. That's what is called a founder market fit in many ways. I mean, part of founder market fit is you have the capability to build this and part of it is that can you reflect the brand. So, uh, um, personal or brand build for the business, these two things have, have, I don't see these as separate, I see these as a combination. So, it's not about, um, I, I, it's not about individual getting the recognition, but it's about the individual being able to take the brand to get that recognition. Right. No, uh, my question is, how much do you think that these entrepreneurs are really ready to invest in term? Because, you know, most of the time what happens is because you're a startup, you think that it's not the time for you to invest in your brand at this point in time. So, how much do you really think that these guys understand or believe uh, that they should and that they do? So, investment is not in terms of money. I didn't mean that. Investment is about, and we'll come to it when I talk about distribution. Okay. Investment is never about the money for the first um, few thousand customers. It's never about that. Uh, so, uh, uh, just just 10 seconds to answer a question that had come up before that, right, on hiring. the team hiring piece. Uh, the one thing that you need to look out for is that one, uh, you know, people tend, a lot of people tend to distribute, uh, get confused between employees who need to have ESOPs versus employees who need to have significant chunks of the company. Please do not give away more than 10, 15 at best. Um, I would say at the early stage, don't give away more than 10 odd percent of your company in ESOPs. Right? It's not a smart thing because when you do your second layer of hiring, right, post to Series B, you will need to park another 5 percent, 6 percent of the company in ESOPs at that stage. So, 
make sure your total ESOP pool doesn't cross 20%, but make sure people understand the value of ESOPs before you hand them up. Uh, I don't think ESOPs are well understood in India uh, because people haven't made too much money off it. So if people, if you think they don't value it, right, don't put it out there. Uh, in terms of where you hire from, a large percentage, a good sign is that a large percentage of your first set of hires actually comes through word of mouth from the people who are working with you. Right? Uh, I actually used to use that as a metric within the business right, to see how many people we're getting through word of mouth because that means it's a good place to work. Right? And your cost of hiring is exceptionally low. Right? So you can spend that additional money in paying that person for the next one year rather than giving it to a consultant. So to that extent, then it could always be smarter if you do it like that. If you don't, if you're unable to do that, right, there are always small agencies which are able to help out for a better fees. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole HR market there. So I don't want to necessarily get into that. But I think that should address most of what you asked. Uh, customer POC, the, in the simplistic form, it would be uh, that you have reached a point where you can prove with customer metrics. Uh, three to six month data which shows that there is uh, there are customers your target group is buying your product and at every transaction level it is a, a margin positive healthy margin whatever the margin in your business model but it's a margin positive transaction so that it is hap happening the way it is likely to happen in steady state rather than being incentivized through a coupon or I mean, there are all sorts of things that you need to do in the beginning, but what I'm saying is that when you have three to six months data which says, here is the data which shows that customers are buying my product, there is adequate repeat in my business, and the next set of customers that are coming, here are the channels that I'm using to acquire those customers. And, you know, so that one can look at that and say, here is the making of a business because the customers are now buying the product. The biggest proof is that so if it's a B2C business, there'll be end customers individuals themselves, it's a B2B business you would want for your specific market, uh, big, some of the big names in the um, uh, ecosystem to have adopted a trial of your product. Better if it is a paid trial because that is, you know, there are free trials and then there are paid trials because paid trials give you a sense that monetization POC is now uh, early POC of monetization from the set of customers you had targeted B2C or B2B is happening. And then the channels you've deployed give a sense with the metrics that yeah, at, as you move on, these channels are scalable, right? That you can go beyond this and build it now uh, going forward. There are lots of iterations needed at various levels. Customer POCs are constantly getting iterated. But the first level of POC is that. So typically, like Kanchan in the beginning said, ideas don't get funded. I mean, you're very lucky if you get funding for an idea. Typically, it's friends and families who come to you at that stage. But otherwise, you would at least five ideas looks at uh, the startup super fuel fund definitely looks for an early POC at the customer level. Just reiterating over here, the most critical pieces that we look at when you say customer, you know, proof of concept is done, right? Needs to be a margin positive transaction because if you're subsidizing that transaction, that's not a viable indicator. So it needs to be a margin positive transaction and right? that means a regular steady state margin reflection there right and this is more for b2c even for b2b this is a fact right second you need to start seeing some elements of repeat behavior because hundreds of people will try something for the first time but if they come back to buy it right that is that that is the truth that's the moment of truth for you saying so the day you get your first repeat customer, please jump with joy, right? Because that's that's a true sign of we call somebody coming through, right? That's that's the true sign of your business actually succeeding with a customer views. It's not when the first customer purchases. <coughs> Similarly, for B two B, a paid trial is not is is one step in that direction. But when that guy who finishes his paid trial actually subscribes to your service, right? That's the true test of the customer's willing to pay the bill and critical work with you on a sustained basis, right? So just keep in mind that it's not, there's no rocket science behind it, but uh, you know, you all in your individual lives also go and try something and say, not worth it, right? Whether it is uh, one thing or the other. So 
So fundamentally, when we say customer POC, it doesn't mean that you know your site has 20 people who used it. Right? It means that you've started seeing some elements of repeat buying behavior. That is what it means for an e-commerce or a transaction-led play. For a B2B play, it needs to be that at least some of your consumers have moved forward from the trial subscription, premium to premium, whatever it might be. Right? I would always, okay, so I would always say a healthy number is between 30 and 40. Anything higher at such an early stage of the business is not a good sign because it means that new customers are not coming at all. Right? So about between 30 and 40 percent of your transactions, right, if they're coming from an existing consumer base, and obviously it'll build up to that over a couple of months, right? It's a great sign. Right? It can be lower, right? But it needs to be in double digits plus for it to be a reasonable, successful POC. Right? Because you're looking at data over two to three months. Right, not not one day. Actually, I have a comment. Making it look very amusing that it's coming from Gaurav. That the two things which you look at is non-subsidized transactions and stickiness, which actually leads to lifetime value. So, I mean, that actually practically makes a lot of the heavily funded e-commerce space actually non-fundable if you look at these two metrics. I mean, not really. Not at all. Just because, so for example, let's take the example of deals in you. Despite having a discounted vertical. MRP to what you call market price, right? In reality, every transaction was making between 20 and 35 percent margin, right? Post post taxes and their post what you call the, let's say the payment gateway charges and delivery, you were still making a net margin of 14 to 17 percent. I'm talking about the guys like customer acquisition is separate. I'm talking of just the what you call marginal transaction. We'll we'll come to that. Right? So. Look, Flipkart also is margin positive on everything except lead categories like medical books. It's not, there's nobody out there who bleeds on a GM basis consistently. Otherwise, the VC might as well be distributing money to everybody who wants to buy on Flipkart directly. Right? It doesn't work like that. So please don't think there is any business that is not based on the fundamentals of a business. And when we said positive transaction, we mean GM positive. And the next leg would be to see in it specifically because this is not only for an e-commerce, but specifically in e-commerce, you would see that post shipping, are you positive, right? Because that at least tells you that what you're charging to the customer, your cost of delivering it to the customer, including buying the product from where you bought it or got it manufactured, right? And the customer making you a payment, which is your payment gateway charges. Between these three things, cost of product, payment gateway, and cost of fulfillment, are you margin positive or not and most businesses who are currently still surviving were margin positive when they started they may have taken certain tactics in between to fund certain category growth or a particular vertical growth which is specific to each business they still remain margin positive business and their contributions are only growing at a unit economics level so yeah okay so um, the last piece sorry but that won't cover overheads. No, it won't. And that's where scale comes in. Right? So when we said at an early stage business, you've got you don't see if, if overheads are also getting covered, then you reach profitability, right? right? We're talking about at a at a unit level, a customer POC is valid if at a one transaction level, whether your customer is a company or your customer is a customer, after making sure that the direct costs associated with that transaction, right? Are you positive or not? And if not, you've got to go back to the drawing board to see if you need to bring your product cheaper, you need to get your cost of whatever. And the other thing is that before a customer POC is arrived at, you should make sure that you have not sunk much money in the business as an entrepreneur, right? Because you don't know how many iterations it will take to reach that right level of POC. Because before the POC is reached, more often than not, unless you have guardian angels in the industry, you will not get investors at healthy terms, right? So um, last but not the least, um, uh, distribution is a space which um, we have been giving immense focus to. Uh, it's also a space which we believe uh, entrepreneurs are not giving adequate focus to. Uh, we believe that um, uh, in the digital ecosystem, no matter which business model you take, the tech more often than not is not a sustainable IP. 
the the technology behind the business you know there's only once in a while that a facebook comes along and once in a while that the search algo of google got created but mostly businesses are not based on real tech i that's one so that's not a competitive advantage in the long run or in the medium run we also believe that merchandising um unless it's something which is a very niche merchandising which no one else is producing doesn't remain ip for long right sourcing merchandising this is for e-commerce in media it is ultimately page views and uh, content consumption there is no ip in that uh, content can be replicated we we, we think that in the, the way the world is going and what is currently uh, you know likely to stay for a good time is that the distribution how much traction your business has with the customers right is the real competitive advantage which genuinely can be unassailable right so um when we think about that we keep thinking about how how entrepreneurs need to give more and more importance to how are you going to find not your first customers but your first 1000 your first 5000 your first 50000 and what it will take to get a 1 lakh customers 1 lakh customers for anything in india and i'm not talking about content consumption 1 lakh paying customers for anything in india is an extremely tough task for any digital entrepreneur and if you can think through what it will take to profitably using digital largely distribute your brand whether it is social whether it is through content um, engagement whether it is through paid advertising these are multiple options paid advertising on social paid advertising on search but essentially if you have figured out how to master at every single stage of the business the next leg of distribution in the digital space right you probably have created a big the biggest competitive weapon that you have for your business and the reason why it is like the most common sensical thing that if you're making a digital business you'll have to do advertising in the digital space or market your brand in the digital space more often than not every early stage entrepreneur is thinking about the product the merchandise is thinking about the tech right is thinking about how to raise money but is not able to answer confidently that what is it going to take to get 30000 50000 people visiting you within the first 3 months right every month and what is it that is going to give you 1000 uh, you know customers in the first 3 months so let me just add to that i mean uh, we can go into some tactical questions around so let me let me just add to that and make this extremely extremely uh, uh, you know clear from my perspective right? we made a ton of entrepreneurs who said You know, we've got the 3,000 visits without any marketing spend. Right? First and foremost, 3,000 visits is nothing. Right? And I'm talking of an example of somebody who was a ex-digital media professional, right? In in this and who set up a business, right? Uh, 3,000 visits is nothing, right? I mean, reality is that if you actually set your mind to it, you should probably be driving 3,000 visits just out of particular you know, your Facebook efforts, right, to your site. More than anything else, or you know, a blog that you do, or something else that you do, that much over a 90-day period is nothing, right? The fact is, if you work on it, right, the amount of traffic that you can generate for your concept, if it's a B2C concept, through non-paid sources, right, which is a combination of SEO, social, because today the uh, you know Indian consumer uh, who's who's online. is extremely young and extremely active and and very prone to trendy things right if you create a buzz brand and create some buzz around it right there is no way in hell that you won't get the kind of attraction that you need to prove your poc if you need to substitute that or if you need to supplement that with intelligent ideas so for example as a person who was doing a local business right he just distributed pamphlets to get people to know that his business existed For five thousand or ten thousand rupees, he distributed some twenty thousand pamphlets in the neighborhood. It may have a half percent conversion, but you can't even buy that much media separately and get you know those many visits. You've got think- to be intelligent about it. Campaigning in markets, getting getting in you know because at the end of the day, these people are all offline and behaving somewhere. You can't say I need advertising to get me off the ground, right? That's the perfectly wrong way. Advertising and outsourcing. till the point in time you hit your poc both those are cuss words right do not use them as an entrepreneur right outsourcing because that means you planning to spend money on something rather than have that capability in house right 
and vertical advertising because you're leaning on a crutch of paid versus vertical actually trying to focus on what your brand can, what your brand should mean to the consumers. Extremely critical. So I'll also like to add that uh, across the globe, in any business model, if you see that the the best startups have not needed a single dollar of paid advertising in the first few months of their business, and they've got to a reasonable level of customer attraction, and have only after that started spending advertising dollars. And that's very important because you know this is this is a this is something which one has to internalize. Because we meet a lot of startups that say, I have a great product, there's a great market need, great market opportunity, and I'm differentiated. And we're asking them, why aren't customers adopting your product? Oh, because I haven't spent any advertising money. And I'm here because once I get advertising money from you, then I will go get customers. Raise customers first. Like there is nothing more important in whether your iterations of the business, where exactly a founder may have a uh, thinking that, XYZ is the real thing that the customers want and unless you get your first thousand customers, how can you know what customers want beyond your own hypothesis? So these things are, I mean the best startups are made which focused on customers not only as an experience, that is obviously a high team, but making sure customers adopt your products fast and you do not need money for that. And you know I can answer any tactical questions around that. but. I, I, or I, we can leave the current conversation and you don't need money for that. And happy to answer any questions offline because for every business model, if you have a, if your brand, if you so you need money in early stages of the business, early stages meaning first thousand, two thousand customers, you need money only your, if your differentiation or your brand is not compelling enough. Brand meaning not brand as a brand, nobody knew fashion and you in the first two thousand customers, right? No one could recollect the brand. So that's not what I'm talking about. But you need money only if basically your story is falling weak. And then if you're going to be on 10 listed places as by paid ads, someone's going to click and someone's going to come and someone's going to purchase. That doesn't make for a brand which has been able to effectively tell the story. So there is no formula of telling the story, but the story, if the story, the consumer is able to understand the story and if you were serving a real market need with a differentiated solution, your first few thousand customers should be the non paid market. So I think I think that's pretty much uh, most of the points that we had to cover. Uh, I think I think that uh, I just want to say one thing that the key to distribution is to make sure that you are really detailed in your customer met metrics. That is one thing I have found that uh, you know everyone's got Google Analytics loaded to their website, but nobody is really studying what's happening, right? So. Uh, there is no other way until unless you're measuring your customer metrics every day right from the day you opened your business you're doing yourself a disservice make sure you have five or six KPIs on the customer side repeat where did they come from which pages did whatever those the things are you know and make sure you have live feedbacks done with the first few customers to know what is working what is not but Measure this every day, you'll yourself get your answers as to how to expand on the first 500 customers into the next 500 and so on. So I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, before, just before we get into questions and I'll get all three of you guys, yeah. I, think, I think just to summarize what Pearl said, right? I think two things that we want to make as honest points and critical points to you guys over there. One, your first 500,000 customers can come without money. Please don't say that I haven't switched on digital advertising so I don't have any consumers. Right? That's, an ex that's a disaster situation. Shows you don't understand distribution and you haven't worked on it. Right? So one, please don't do that. Second, please understand that distribution is probably the biggest competitive advantage you will have over your competition because technology is only three to six months gap. Right? So speed and scale and consumer traction are the critical pieces of building out any sort of a distribution led strategy. Focus on it just as much as you focus on your product. Focusing too much on product and too little on distribution will be doing a disservice to the business. Right? I think those are the two things we wanted to make sure you guys get. Right? Anything else? Uh, questions? So, I have, I have. so yes. I was at the detailing event yesterday and I was listening to this VC uh, seminar basically. Apparently, that the notion is um, the companies, the pure play e-commerce companies are not easily getting funded nowadays. It is, unless, you 
know, if they have multi-channel or different strategy along the way. <coughs> is that true according to you? I mean, is that something that you guys as a seed fund also look I think that's factual because the amount of money it takes to build one of those businesses is tremendous. A horizontal, a pure play e-commerce horizontal is just damn expensive to build. I mean, so you would, I mean, as a seed fund, you would also prefer a model that's a niche play, a niche play in the e-commerce space. Yeah. That would make a lot more sense. And I think uh, a niche play is one answer, and also added to that is that. Um, uh, to your question whether you know there should be physical plus online retailing combination it depends on the market that you are it totally depends on the market there is no denying that in India in certain segments the physical retail is so well entrenched as a way to buy that making sure you get some visibility there whether through own channels or multi-brand out to whichever format there are multiple formats yeah. just that I would I would say that a digital entrepreneur should not go into a physical retailing unless they understand that because that side is also fairly complex and margin sapping. Right. It's not easy to scale, right. right? So if opening one store in one locality will never anyways get make you a national brand. Absolutely. So if you have a scalable physical channel retailing complemented to your e-commerce, it can work wonderfully well, but not for all businesses. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to understand how about crowdfunding as a concept? Uh, yeah, it's a great concept, it's just not legal in India. Okay. Second thing, uh, you were talking about, you know, you were against outsourcing things. We are in the process of build, uh, building our own venture and when we are looking, you know, apart from the marketing and the sourcing of this, this from vendors, management and all, we are looking to outsource the other thing like uh, setting up the website to managing the logistics part of it, the customer service <coughs> thing, to a site called billbazaar.com, which is Infibim's venture. So means we would we would not like to get into all those things. What are your views on it? My views are previously stated. So two things: an entrepreneur has only so much money. The moment you start outsourcing, you are taking a part of that money. Let's say you have 10 lakhs to start with, or 20 lakhs to start with. You have committed 4 lakhs to somebody else making profit on those activities, right? So at least 2 out of those 4 lakhs is wasted. So it's an inefficient way to do things. However, right? if, your, if your question is, just I, I just want to make sure that if it's, there's a platform available like uh, a Builder Bazaar or you know the e-commerce platforms that are available and That's you can exactly. quickly in 2 days, 5 days get a site up. So if a business has got a small scale, Right, and you want to initially as an entrepreneur, you've got domain That's experience and in your beta you want to use that while your product is getting developed, it's fine. If your business is never going to be of big scale and will need constant innovation and customization, then also it's fine even for the long run. But usually big businesses require a lot of innovation and a lot of change change management in the technology and it's be better to own it if you're going that route. Our concern uh, is on two sides. One is where customer services. I need to set up a call center kind of thing. Uh, if someone can, you know, give me three people there in their own call center setup, then it gives me a dedicated line, and I'm giving to my customer customer service desk, and then the technology part of ERP and stuff. stuff that's like infrastructure so outsourcing. So that's please fine. don't. There's a core function right now. If as a business you're outsourcing, if you're a digital business and you're outsourcing your technology piece. Right? You've already written it off as a key advantage area or a key differentiator in any form. Right? And that's a large part in a digital business, the digital piece itself. And right? that's the large part of it. If you're if you're a small uh, if you're a small uh, let's say for example, our website, Five Ideas website is hosted on Moonproof. Right? We built it ourselves over on one weekend, right? We built the entire website. But we used a do-it-yourself tool like Moonfruit to build it to host it. When I say outsource, it doesn't mean ki I will have my own server to host my own website. I will do everything in source. That's not what it means. It means none of your key functions should be out of your control because those are the capabilities you will need to build a business later. So personally, I'm an absolute not fan of outsourcing customer service so early in a business. Simple reason. Your business may not have the volumes initially that you need to have an IVR set up, right? 
but if the closer you are to your consumer the more the faster your loop will close the less it will be stuck in process you'll get 10 orders a day initially 20 <coughs> orders a day initially god knows for the first few months right tell me why can't you manage that with the epabx and two people and three peak extensions connected to it yeah? with any epabx today you can get basic data also in it <coughs> right you can get drop calls average call time from any random epabx all you need is a dedicated epabx on this that will cost you nothing and even you ask for a lease line they'll give you that free right so i i'm not a fan of outsourcing customer service per se especially in the early stages of a business because that's your only real connect that's your feedback close loop with the customer yeah but we have to outsource a key function just because of the fact that we thought that look i know the other guy would be having a profit component but if i try to do it in house i'm going to make a lot more mistakes there's a lot of learning curve i need to go through probably this is not the right time right now let's say i have the first minimum viable product now and then in the meanwhile you can continue building those pipeline possible i'm not i'm not commenting on it because every specific instance is different I am not a fan of this particular this thing because the easiest thing to do is say let's outsource it. I am doing the thinking. Technology is being built by someone. Finance is being run by someone. Uh, marketing is being done by the agency. I am the CEO. Of what? Of what? I mean, if everybody else is doing something, what the hell are you doing? Right? I mean, I am not saying that it is. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bad strategy at an early stage because it is dilute. Capital is very scarce, so use it intelligently. If you think it's an intelligent decision, given the specific variables of the situation, please go ahead and do it. If it's a critical function of the business, I wouldn't recommend it because that's a core capability people will see needs to be in the team if it's got to get funded and grow. Right. So if I don't have a capable CTO and I've outsourced it to Tom Dick Harry to make my website, there's a huge gap in the team. Maybe you'll have a great website being put together by them, but there'll be no documentation. There's no Indian software company does any documentation which is worth its money, right? And then tomorrow you'll be saying, oh, I want to change this, but I don't know how. And then you'll be putting patchwork on that code, and then you'll jump the entire thing and find another guy. Will rebuild you something else altogether again without any documentation. You will again clueless every time you want to make a change. It's very inflexible that whole system. It doesn't work. We've seen it. Uh, we've seen it fail several times. We've seen it cause problems several times. We have just uh, maybe one more question. Uh, then we can, you know, you can write to us for So let me be honest with you. There are lots and lots and lots of variables that go into it, right? From the kind of capital that will be required to build this business out, the amount of money that will need, which it will need, the quality of the founders themselves, the viability of the idea. So it's very hard to generalize. But I'd say, that being said, I'd say anything from a 50 lakhs to a crore in this play, in this space, right? First here. And the early stage individual angels kind of thing. Right. Uh, I think this would be anything from, let's say, that one crore mark, going to about five, six, seven crores. Most often, sometimes a little higher than that, okay. right? Uh, when you do a pre-series A kind of round, right. then it will go a little higher than that. But then the risk by then is considerably lower. So by then a business would be doing like 400, 500 transactions a day, right? For a pre-series A kind of round. Right? So then the valuations will jump to like 15, 16 crores. But uh, consequently, what you'll also see is that the business has already got so much uh, positive volume that the risk is relatively low. Yes. And then here, uh, typically you'd be you'd be starting out at about uh, 20, 25 crores, 20 crores valuation, right, and going all the way to the top. Right? So very broad. This is not. Please don't hold me to it. This is absolute junk. I am saying this myself. That what I said is junk. Because there are so many variables that have a play, right? Because at the end of the day, all you're doing is pricing risk. I would actually say this is more important than this when you look at valuations. Because here, this is the various stages of risk. At a concept, all the risks are open. At product beta, let's say you've launched, you've done, you've taken the, some of the product risk off the table. At a customer POC, you've launched, you've proven that the concept works 
products and consumer traction may be possible to do at a viable medical basis. At scalable UE, use of unit economics, you're basically saying it is possible to scale this. However, whether it is sustainable or not is still to be seen. Right? So every stage you're basically taking some risk off the table for the investors. All of this is risk capital at the end of the day. Right? So the more risks that seem to vanish, and some of these maybe you know, you know, and you've got a similar set of variables on the founder side, right? Whether it's the team, whether it's the you know background, whether they've done this before, whether the domain knowledge is so there's so many variables that come together that what I've said is complete rubbish. However, since you wanted me to say something, I've said something. <laughs> Marketplaces are extremely difficult to build in India uh, for the simple reason that uh, you know getting organizing sellers on one side and getting buyers on the other is not an easy job. Uh, but if you're able to do it, you'd make a lot of money. But fundamentally, I think it's really difficult to build out marketplaces. Almost all the marketplaces that I've seen have become stagnant after a certain scale. Whether you look at eBay, whether you look at India Times, whether you look at uh, you know uh, traders, whether you look at uh, you know any one of the marketplaces, pick them randomly, right? And they've been fairly challenged. Right? They hit a certain scale and they stagnate. But something like Zomato, or that's not okay. So I don't see Zomato as a marketplace. Zomato is not a marketplace. Zomato is more of a classified. No, Flipkart is still a retailer. So, Flipkart has now also started. Okay, that, that's just a that's not a. Don't worry. No, no, but yeah. So you know, I mean, as a business model, it continues to scale across the globe, right? There are unique challenges because the supplier side on any business area in India is extremely fragmented and totally unorganized and non-tech savvy. So the, that's the biggest challenge: the onboarding of suppliers, auditing them, and keeping them in check is the biggest issue. You mentioned issue. about the advertising, you know, but in case of marketplace, you need some critical mass. And how do you make that critical mass happen? Is advertising not an option? Then? No, advertising is always, always an, option. an option. I just said that the, to get your POC done, you don't need paid advertising. You don't need paid advertising. Your POC, your marketplace POC, your, your marketplace POC can happen with a thousand customers. Yeah. Thousand customers and like twenty thousand SKUs, or thirty thousand SKUs, or getting critical thirty thousand SKUs rated by like hundred suppliers. Having said that, I hear what you are trying to say. That in this case, because it's a chicken and egg, right? That like you said, that you've got to have a bare minimum level of suppliers, and then quickly get the customers. Otherwise, these suppliers will start vanishing because they're not in your control. So typically, the funding that needs typically that's why marketplaces are held by not small players. But they are typically big companies behind it, and so on, because the initial capitalization required is too much before a real. I think niche marketplaces yeah. they still are workable. Yeah, niche marketplaces are workable. Right, but I think I think uh, horizontal marketplaces are extremely expensive to build, like horizontal e-commerce today. If you were in this space 10 years ago, I would say go for it. Right, but it's 10 years hence, and you're a decade late. Right, so unless you really want to take on a challenge, I would not say that go horizontal. I'd say go niche. That's why Because of any other reason, 
that's a challenge you have to solve first. Going digital or staying offline is not going to solve that. You know, so if Maruti starts selling their, uh, uh, you know, um, Kishashi online also, it won't sell. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Maruti is so much in the same way. Once you start saying, give me 20 lakhs for Maruti, people say, why oh, are you that? Right? Not worth it. Right? So, fundamentally, I'm saying that you've got to figure out what are the reasons that it's not uh, being able to sell. So, if all the due diligence is done, then this could be... Remember, this digital is only one, one, one form of distribution. Right? Digital is nothing more than that. Yeah, Television is uh, a particular one form of distribution. It's just a way to reach out to a consumer. Yeah, yeah, so, so what the question? I'm saying the fundamental value proposition of the product needs to be there irrespective of the dis distribution medium. The distribution medium can only make you reach some additional consumers. Right? So please don't think that digital is a different world. It's, the, so, it's just a way to connect with different people. Uh, you know, people. That's it. So uh, if your value proposition exists, it will exist offline and online. And if your value proposition doesn't exist, right, it doesn't exist per se. This is just a form of reaching out to consumers. That's it. That's all digital. The question was very simple. The question was, uh, I am sure what said. The question was that, do I need to really go to someone who is running a website which does all this? Or do I have to develop something myself and... I don't know your product, so it will be a hard to generalize. You can have a... Just write to me and that will be easy. Last question, guys. So it's a function of repeat. As your repeat rate keeps going up, right, you'll start seeing, you'll start seeing better ROI on your uh, this thing. So what you really look at is uh, CAC to LTV, right, which is customer acquisition cost to long-term value lifetime value of the consumer and what you'd like to see is that the consumer repeats with you anything between four and six times in a year. If you can get to that four to six times repeat a decent basket size on the other uh, other end, typically more often than not you'll end up with positive unit economic touch. I mean obviously it's dependent upon margins, days, that. Yeah. At the end of the day you're basically looking at all these things as an overall combination. I'm trying to keep it simple because I'm not, you know, it's a one-hour session. We can't address everything possibly in a one-hour session. We've already made it almost two. So, you know, so I'm just, I'm just going to leave it at that. But there are enough. You just write to us, and we'd be happy to have a chat. Thank you so much. So on the move, we've got some cool. Thank you.